in the not too distant future. Following the rapid succession of World Wars 3 and 4, plus the hidden horrors of secret World War 2, there's not much left. All that remains is a place where folks get together to read and discuss comic books. Sometimes they laugh, sometimes they argue, but they always record and upload their transmissions. You've found one of those transmissions today. Welcome to The Last, Last. Comic, comic Shop. Greetings from the future! Welcome to The Last Comic Shop, but this week we're heading back to the past, I believe. Yes, back to those hallowed years of 1984. It is very the hallowed true. We're, we're just going to lose half of our uh, podcast listening audience because they weren't born yet, probably. <laughs> I'm the host of the most, Andy Larson, and welcome back. But for those people that weren't born yet, boy, oh boy, did you miss out on a lot of great stuff. Atari released Marble Madness in arcades. The Transformers debuted on all of our airwaves and incredible films like Ghostbusters, Temple of Doom, and Karate Kid all graced our movie screens. And you're forgetting this is a comic book podcast. 1984 was Marvel's Secret Wars. The storyline based awesome crossover with everybody thrown in. They just made them all fight. Ah, and I did love that. Like every like two or three years, I'll go back and I'll reread all of Secret Wars just because I have such fond memories. It gave us the black suit. It gave us those awesome scenes where like Doctor Doom keeps on disintegrating uh, Captain America and he just keeps on popping back and forward. Oh, Hulk underneath the mountain. Hulk underneath the mountain. And Spidey jobs out the entire X-Men. It's, it's such great stuff. But we're not talking about Secret Wars on this show. We're actually talking about another Marvel property that was released in 1984, and that is the Demon Bear Saga from New Mutants. Probably the most famous non-Rob Liefeld new mutants thing out there i guess i don't know uh, i would give you that one yeah i mean you got it, uh, what new mutants 86 and then demon bear that's pretty much what people remember right no, no 98 it's the first appearance of uh vanessa the fake domino <laughs> yes i w- i once offered to trade someone for the first appearance of domino i was like i'll give you domino's first appearance you give me the first appearance of gideon <laughs> I feel yeah, like you. Th- that was bit. that was not a smart trade, sir. I, I, oh, you betray your lack of Liefeld knowledge. Gideon's first appearance is also New Mutants '98, the first appearance of Deadpool. One of those books that's worth a bajillion dollars now. <laughs> okay. Well, in any case, yes, we are reviewing the Demon Bear Saga on today's program. I'm joined by my wonderful co-hosts Chad Smith and Jay Hay Scott, who you've already heard. And guys, did I miss anything else in 1984 you might want to bring up? We had the Summer Olympics in L.A. Yeah, that was the one that Russia boycotted, not us, right? That was the Correct. 81 was the one we were like, no, no. That's because why they had the... to do the contest of champions. Really? It was supposed to be an Olympic crossover. But we backed out of the Olympics. So that's why we have crossovers, because that was the first real big Marvel crossover was Contest of Champions. Without that, again, you wouldn't get Secret Wars. Damn it, we're back to Secret Wars again. We're not talking about Secret Wars. I promise we'll do that on a, a future show. But yes, I was all of five years old, and I was not reading New Mutants at the time. But since then, I have read Demon Bear Saga, and it is one of the best X-Men stories that, at least in my opinion, that I've had the honor of reading. And so we're going to be covering it on today's program. But one of the main reasons that we're doing that is because finally, on HBO Max in the last couple of weeks, they released the New Mutants movie for freeze. I guess you have to have the HBO subscription, but you don't need anything else. It's not like you had to buy a DVD of it or go to a movie theater or do whatever you needed to do. Rent a VHS copy. (laughs) Get a VHS copy. Find that one blockbuster that's still open and go. But at the same time, they were finally released it on some place where you can stream it at your own house and you can just watch it. The movie itself was like, it's a media mystery to me how this movie happened. Like, it was released in the middle of the pandemic to theaters? Yeah! I, honestly, the only reason that they couldn't was because Disney bought Fox. 
that they had to give theatrical releases to anything that was left on Fox's schedule. And this was on Fox's schedule. So it was in the contract that they couldn't release it directly to streaming. They had to give it a theatrical release. And as a result of COVID, it kept on getting pushed back, you know, month after month after month. I know this is a movie that I've wanted to review on a podcast for like two years. Oh. Like sincerely. Right, Chad? It, no. And, and plus, in addition to uh, the fact that it, you know, came out in theaters in the midst of the pandemic, now we have a Marvel movie debuting on HBO Max. What's yeah. up with that? Right. Well, again, that's because of the way those distribution rights are. I think that Fox made a deal with HBO Max to release their movies there before, again, Disney bought them. So, like, for right now, HBO Max is going to get these last of the, well, I guess the last of the Fox movies in New Mutants. But regardless of why it was on HBO Max, if you're lucky enough to have it, Go out and watch it because we're about to review it. Guys, what did you think of the new Mutants movie? I'm glad we had to watch it for the show because I probably wouldn't have watched it. It had been panned so badly in the media that I wouldn't have watched it. It's got a lot of things going for it. It's a very tight, contained story. There's not a lot of characters. If you know the Demon Bear story, if you know the original New Mutants, it's almost like one of those movies made for comic book geeks. People who aren't in the know aren't going to have as much invested and know who these characters are. It's not your typical superhero origin story type movie. And it's short. It's, you know, in this day and age of four hour long epics and our tour blah it's like 95 minutes long or something it's really short heck yeah on that i was so happy to have something that was self-contained after and no offense to the mcu or the snyderverse we've it seems like the last few years it's been all these big bloated you have to have seen all these other movies to understand the continuity and the nuances that wasn't this this they just throw you right in and this was like We've talked before uh, about how the Fox movies, the mutant movies, uh, towards, like, they never really caught up to the MCU. They were always kind of like that early 2000s era style, where it was like a little bit of superhero, but they changed a lot for mass appeal because they didn't have a lot of faith in all the superhero stuff. Um, And I thought this was one of the best examples of how you could make that work. They really focused in on the teenagers and gave them personalities that seemed realistic or, you know, as realistic as teenagers are. But, like, the, the kids felt like teens. And this was not a special effects event type thing, but it didn't need to be. It was a very personal story. Well, I, I want to jump in with uh, your, your comment about the special effects, because, honestly, I sat down and I started to watch New Mutants, and I went in there, and I, I knew what the critics had said about this movie. And I, I thought to myself, as the special effects started rolling out, as the plot started rolling out, I said, boy, oh boy, was this a movie that should have never been in theaters. That's the thing that I thought to myself. And I'm not going to say that critically, because there was a place for this particular movie. It was, in fact, a very, very, very good cable made-for-TV movie. That's the kind of vibe that I got off of New Mutants when you had a very limited cast very limited sets the special effects, meh the demon bear was kind of uncanny valley at times uh, it just didn't look right at some in some of the, the wide angle shots and I just didn't buy it and halfway through the movie that's when I switched gears and I said what if this had just been put out on say Freeform as, as a special right after you know Cloak and Dagger which I did watch You know, if this was just a made-for-TV movie that was put out on one of these cable networks aimed at young adults, aimed at teens, trying to get them interested in new X-Men, this would have succeeded very, very well. Take that one step further. I think this would have been a blockbuster exclusive. (laughs) You know, something you'd have rented and you're like, okay, this 
I can see it, and you, you have fun for an hour and a half, and then you're out. No, I, I agree. That's that that's the thing. But what, when I, what I'm saying is I didn't think it was very theatrical. And maybe that's because, to your point, it didn't seem like anything from the MCU or anything from the DC universe that we're used to. These overblown, very high special effects, high production value, lots of cast, lots of scenery, lots of locations. You didn't get any of that. So it felt very contained and very... I'm not going to say cheap because that's that's derogatory. I'm just going to say that it, it just seemed like something that was made for a, a smaller I, a audience. No, I don't know. Too kind. I think somebody's cousin Dave worked at one of the big studios, and in the off time, they were CGI and Demon Bear, <laughs> and then sending that out. Right. And I'm okay with that. Right. I can respect it. It's it's. It's low budget, but it's it's for what it is. I thought it was really well done. I thought Demon Bear was all right. I thought the CG, uh, especially on Magic, was awesome. Everything Magic did in the movie was awesome. Magic's just awesome. <laughs> Except true. for her last name, which should end in an A and doesn't. <laughs> what? That I don't understand. Yeah, the, you, uh, you have feminine to explain. forms of Russian last names. Females in Russia, and I don't know if this is... A fast fact, or it's just mostly done. But usually, uh, family names in Russia, if they're female, end in an A. So Romanov, but then the female form of that is Romanova. He should be Ilyana Rasputina. That's, I guess, that's true. Nicole would be Nicole Larsona. Nicole Larsona. <laughs> Well, I did want to ask, was there a particular character that uh, from the New Mutants movie that, that you feel like uh, was nailed particularly right? I honestly really like the San Guthrie. Uh, I, I like Charlie Heaton anyways from Stranger Things. And so I thought that he had that, you know, West Virginia twang to his sound. You know, he was holding that the piece of coal. He really did act as the leader of that group indirectly. So I've read New Mutants comics for years. I never imagined Sam's powers working like that. Like, the way they portrayed it in the movie, but it made sense. Like, just how, how violent and, like, you know, he's just shooting off in, like, one direction and doesn't really have any control over it. Like, it totally tracks with early New Mutants Cannonball, except for the fact that his arm was broken, and we all know that the Cannonball is not invulnerable when he's blasting. <laughs> so there's no reason he should have a broken arm. Yeah, I didn't get that either, but then... There's that scene where he's punching himself, where he's, like, just making one part of his body cannonball-esque and then hitting himself in the face, you know, self-harm. So I assume that was a reflection of his self-harm. He, he like, you know, charged up one half of his body and broke his arm with his other half. And you mentioned this self-harm. There's a lot of deep, dark stuff in this movie. I think this is, you know, especially for teens that are going through things like... This steps real close to a couple of lines where it's like, all right, this should be taken seriously. Yeah, and I'll just say I thought that the entire cast, all the actors did a really great job. I thought Anya Taylor-Joy, who did, who played Magic, and uh, Maisie Williams. Sorry. Yes, and, and Maisie Williams, the uh, Wolfsbane Rain Sinclair. Also, were really good. And also, it was interesting, you know, the some of the changes they made to the characters. It's nice to see the... Danny and Rain kindling romance. That's I don't. That's not in the book. That's something that no. They they're just the very film. very close friends in the book. Yeah. They, it was a yeah. different kind of relationship. But I think uh, knowing a lot of what Chris Claremont had done, I think this just made it more explicit. And I think it worked. I thought it oh, worked absolutely. really well. Um, yeah. No. It was it was the emotional uh, center of the relationship between Danielle Moonstar and Wolfsbane. That's what grounded the story and made it more believable. Uh, the one thing I didn't like was the fact that they didn't really do much with Sunspot at all. Mm. Like, he was almost an afterthought at, at, at times. You mean uh, A.C. Slater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, Sunspot in the in the book was often an afterthought as well. So I thought it just tracked with <laughs> oh. It's harsh, but true. And on the note of Sunspot, I was kind of disappointed we didn't get to see the black, like, Kirby Crackle version of his powers. Right. Like, but even with that, the changes they made in this movie were all changes, like, I could understand how they really embraced the characters. They accentuated the stuff they needed to accentuate. And, uh, you know, on such a, a seemingly low budget, the, the, the job they got done, I keep going back to that. 
Okay. Well, real quickly, before we go to commercial break, let's give it a quick grade. So uh, just uh, one out of four scale, real quickly, what are you going to rate, Chad? Uh, I'm going to go a, a B plus, so I think that would be a 3.25. I forget how those numbers translate. All right, 3.25. It was a solid B movie, so I'll give it, give it the plus even. All right. J.A.? Yeah, I, I would say this is a three out of four VHS rentals. <laughs> I think I'm going to go a little bit lower. I think I'm going to give it a 2.75. I couldn't get over the special effects. And at times, you know, they didn't do enough with some of the characters. They didn't do enough with the relationship between Cannonball and Sunspot. They they spent a lot of time on certain relationships. And kind of like the guys in the story, they were just there. And that's, eh. Tracks just like the comic book. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, all right. All the performances, though, for this, like for a new mutants movie, we had a new mutants movie, okay. and the, the actors were good. The other thing I note, I get you with the CGI, but how cool was it when friggin' magic powers up her soul her sword for the first time? Yes, I was like, <laughs> well, but how how lame were those slender people with the big giant jaws running that- around? Well, that was my big complaint. Where, yeah, the happy face guys. I'm like, wait a minute, yeah. those aren't hell beings. Nah, it's not from Limbo. And I love that the big bad wasn't like the uh, the Alice Braga character. Also, you know, was sort of the bad principal that yeah. you know holds you down, but is not like some uber evil mutant bent on world destruction type thing. Okay. And the one last point I would make, and I, I alluded to this earlier, it was connected to the X-Men universe, but you didn't need to know that the Essex folks were Mr. Sinister, and that was connected to Deadpool. You didn't need to know about Charles Xavier, but they put just enough Easter eggs that it was satisfying, but not so much, you know, overtook the movie. Okay, fair enough. Well, we've got the uh, comic book to talk about right after these commercial breaks, so stay tuned. We are going to be talking about Chris Claremont and Bill Sienkiewicz doing the Demon Bear Saga, one of the great X-Men stories. So, right after these commercial breaks. Hey, everybody. Hey. I'm Ashley. And I'm Nagy. We're from Rock Candy Podcast. Kind of like behind the music, except unauthorized and drunk. But come along every week and listen to us talk about artists or albums that you may know really well or may have never heard of while we're drinking beers. Witty things to talk about. Great hot takes with some hot babes. (laughs) That's subjective, but okay. (laughs) So go find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and wherever you catch your pods. And with that, party party on, on, kids. Well, that sounded forced. Is it not? I went back with more of The Last Comic Shop, and it is now time for our review of an actual comic book. Now, we just don't do comic book movies here. We actually review comics. That is our bread and butter. And we've got a fantastic one on today's program. It is the Demon Bear Saga. It is only three issues of the New Mutants run. Uh, 18, 19, and 20. Done by... Chris Claremont on writing duties with uh, Bill Sienkiewicz on art. And this three-issue run was instrumental, I think, in certain parts of the New Mutants movie. They, They drew heavily from this. And while at the end of the movie there are no post credit scenes, you should stick around for the credits because there's some really nice Bill Sienkiewicz art in the credits he's gone and drawn all of the movie characters you know the actors and actresses for the credit scene so if you're a fan of bill sinkevich if you're a fan of the original new mutants you owe it to yourself to watch the the credit well there you go and real quickly just to give you a little bit of background about you know again we talked about 1984 we talked about that even though again i was only five years old when this this uh, this book originally was out on uh, newsstands and and my normal pickups at that time were things like marvel tales or the marvel star wars comics I, I do remember my older brother just commenting all the time about how much electricity was generated when Bill Sienkiewicz took over from actually a really great artist who was doing the book right before him, which was our favorite, Sal Bushima. Sal was like, we love Sal Bushima art. 
And to kind of say, like, okay, you're replacing Sal Bushima and it's going to, like, take, you know, that book one step further. Ultimately, I've always said that the, the why Bill Sienkiewicz always really worked really well on New Mutants is just simply because it, he kind of tapped into that punk rock, that anarchist chip on the shoulder, MTV, like, early 80s visual representation of the misfit like you know he has the over exaggerated characters and the the squiggly sketchy lines coming all over the place and good god they blow up professor xavier three pages in like this is it's punk rock in comic book form for sure yes so basically here's your 10 cent synopsis for the demon bear saga uh, again on the surface the demon bear is just culmination of uh, another of the multitude of Claremont subplots that he was constantly introducing in X-Men books. This particular one is surrounding Daniel Moonstar, who is hunted by this mystical creature called the Demon Bear that had murdered her parents years before and was after Danielle to finish the job on her family. And uh, despite pleas from her teammates that the threat really wasn't real, you know, all the rest of the new mutants kind of dismiss it. Danielle knew how ridiculously large the problem was. And so she spends a ton of time training in the danger room and decides she's going to go it alone and fight the demon bear. She and goes out bear hunting. <laughs> and she fails miserably not because she's not powerful not because she's not prepared but because this is a hulking bloodthirsty animalistic predator that only has one goal in life and that's to end daniel moonstar prior to this story the demon bear was shown as a bear and it was pretty terrifying in regards to what shal bushima showed us but when Senkevich gets a hold of the demon bear, it is just gigantic. Four stories tall. Whole pages. And just dwarfs Daniel Moonstar. It is it fierce. It is imposing. It is deadly. And so at the end of the day, Daniel Moonstar it basically is near death after this experience and they rush her to the hospital, the rest of the new mutants. And at that point, it becomes a base under siege story where basically the new mutants know that the demon bear is going to be coming for Danielle to finish the job. And they've got to defend her long enough for her to survive. You know, they end up going into some strange extra dimensional plane of existence to fight the demon bear and magic used gets to use her sword a lot. She's new to the team, but ends up being the MVP. It's just a great story. And I, I've gushed enough. Let's get J.A.'s initial thoughts. He's a huge fan of magic. So, again, what did you think of the Demon Bear saga? Take the movie and just, you know, put it on steroids. It's, it's a great three-issue run. I can't gush enough about the covers. So, the interior art by Bill Sienkiewicz is great. The covers are a completely another plane. There's your normal comic book art. It's not pencils and pens. It's these beautiful i don't know if it's watercolors or if he did it with crayon i don't know uh jay time out cover for number 19 is one of the stickers in the marvel 80th anniversary sticker set i was telling you guys on show the other day the covers for these three issues especially that first one with daniel moonstar and the bear in the background and the xavier mansion that could have been a movie poster it no, I I agree that that, that Sienkiewicz's art and it really steals the show here. I mean, I think under an, another artist's hands, a lot of these exchanges that happen within these three issues, I'm honest, they could have been botched. They could have come across hokey or forced instead of this visual metaphorical powerhouse. I mean, at the heart, the Demon Bear is the living embodiment of all of the suffering inflicted upon the Native Americans. Like, that's what he is. Like, he's a cancer created by rage and disillusionment and pain. And I think Sienkiewicz's art brings that into focus. It wants its pound of flesh in retribution. It really does. And there is a great, great scene. It comes in issue three where they go to the Badlands. They're transported to this extra-dimensional plane. And Sienkiewicz shows you, like, a map of all of this Bladlands extra-dimensional place and, like, the demon bear sitting in the middle of it. This area of white, and it's just this black 
splotch. And it's there to show scale and how big it is. But again, to me, it's kind of like seeing somebody and being like, yes, that is a cancer being inflicted upon another living organism. It's something of hatred and evil eating up this landscape. I think it's just gorgeous. If I can interject with your prior point before you you jump off of this, it fits so well with Chris Claremont's style of storytelling. So Chris Claremont is, is known for... You know, sending his characters into the psychic planes and, and doing all this weird stuff. And you have things like the Shadow King and just as much mental as they are physical. And Sienkiewicz's style just it melds so greatly, especially in this book where sometimes with Sienkiewicz, the art can overpower the story. Uh, and here I think it's pitch perfect to go along to get you to feel those emotions. It's just the right amount of exaggeration and just the, the absolute terror in some of these images that he's able to convey. I, I think there are fewer people that could, outside of John Byrne, that could handle a Chris Claremont story and make it so visually appealing and yet so clear and get across those emotional notes that Claremont loves to hit. The other neat thing about this book, and I wanted to get you guys' thoughts, is I always thought that this was a perfect story for actually the New Mutants. Because if you read this book, Again, Magic's new to the team. Magma, who's uh, she's actually fairly new. Daniel Moonstar, who's been a basically a, a member of the original team, she's actually out of commission. So you've got really only like Wolfsbane and, and Cannonball and Sunspot. They're the only ones that really have worked together. And uh, I feel like tease up that whole notion of like teenagers coming together in a moment of crisis, uh, coming of age together. And, and make each other better because of this circumstance that they've been forced into. I, right, I don't, don't make it look easy, though. Like, these are still teenagers, and you can still see the conflicts, and you can still see, oh, Sam's, you know, he's been trying to flirt with her for a long time, but Amara doesn't care. It's going to be so sad. But there are all those little teenage dramas that are still a part of it. But like you said, this is that classic story where they're coming together as a team. The whole reason the new mutants are going after the demon bear is to make amends with Danny because they didn't believe her. Aww. Like she's been talking about this stuff all this time. Like, yeah, 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 whatever. And then, you know, they find her mauled by a giant demon bear. And it's like, oh, oh, we better step up. And that's, yeah, it's like, they, it's like Claremont takes all these, what we now call, you know, the YA tropes, young adult tropes, and twists them. So it's all, you know, we didn't believe her, we kicked her out of our clique in school, and now we're trying to make amends and bring her back in because she got hurt, and, oh, you know, please forgive us, we were stupid teenagers, we didn't know any better, except they're stupid teenagers that can, you know go a mile a minute as fast as a cannonball or turn as hot as the sun or if you're magic, you know, kill tainted souls with your sword and release <laughs> demons that have taken over your body. And don't forget have the healer show up for three panels at the end to make sure everything's okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, but that's overlooked by the two panels that Bill Sienkiewicz gives us of a glorious Mohawk storm. <laughs> that was That's actually my only gripe about this particular story is the healer popping up at the end uh, I'll, I'll comment on that in a, a little bit but i think this book works better again as a new mutant story better than ever could as any other x-men book you couldn't have folks like cyclops or wolverine or storm or colossus you couldn't have those guys going up against the demon bear in a story like this you need young kids that have to like figure out how they're going to work when again a lot of them don't even trust magic at the beginning of the story like they don't trust her at all they think that she's gonna like betray them because she was trained by some sort of demon you know balesco or as i say diet Memphisto. so even she's an outcast among the outcasts and she ends up being the mvp like she's the one that comes to the rescue in the end heck yeah and as somebody that in my real life i work with teenagers all the time one of the things about teens is they feel things so much more intensely. At that age, they're they're figuring stuff out. Well, like, yeah, I was going to say, at, at the base level, the book, just like the movie, is really, you know, learning to confront your fears and deal with 
as you're becoming an adult, as you're you're no longer a child, you don't have your parents to always protect you, but you're not an adult. You haven't figured out how to handle these giant emotions and what to do with them and how to live in a society and overcome those things. This is what this book is about, right? Ultimately, you have to it's, confront it's, your demon bears. Yes. That's true. And kill them with a giant <laughs> Yeah. Well, I- I, I can't say that this is the the one one of the reasons why I liked the book more than the movie was again I liked the buildup of the demon bear in the book. Of course, it's a comic book, so you have a little more time to build it up. But boy, oh boy, uh, from the moment that the New Mutants find Danielle's body just bloody and battered and near death in that harsh, unforgiving snow, that's pumping the tires of your villain one oh one. Like, he is a credible threat from that point on. He has the capability of ending them in the most violent and unpleasant ways possible. Like, in the movie, I never got that. Like, you saw the Demon Bear and how hulking and strong it was at the end, but you never saw it, like, ripped to shreds nearly a member of the New Mutants in in that actual movie. All right, can I counter... Just playing Demon Bear Advocate here for the movie. And why I think the movie did something slightly better uh, than the book. And like I said, the book is great. It has all these emotions, these teenagers coming together. That was awesome. But I thought the movie even more so focused on the choices that people have to make. And there are certain things like at the end of the book, or Danny Moonstar's parents come back. And it's like, wait a minute. (laughs) But in the movie, you know, you, you don't have those easy outs, but you have at the end of the movie, Danny Bear, and they have that line at the end about the two bears that are fighting for your soul. And one is, you know, the hope and the love and perseverance or whatever it was, is all the good stuff. And the other one was the fear and pain and the hatred and all the bad stuff. You're, you know, which bear is going to win the fight? And she's like, my dad always told me it, it, it's the one you feed. Aww. And they show her walking away with her friends and like, these, these kids that were being trained as killers, but now they're walking away, they're choosing their own path. And I thought that that focus on the choices was so uplifting. And it, because this was just a one and done movie, it didn't need to worry about continuity. It didn't need to worry about, you know, what are we going to do for issue 21? You know, when we bring Warlock in, which Warlock is awesome, but it didn't have to worry about that stuff. Whereas the comic book did. And so the comic book, gets right. some things at the end and it's like, ah, uh, okay. But, and I, I, everything you said I agree with, but it's just not quite as cool having that demon bear just kind of fade away as he touches his nose than having magic come down with the f***ing sword and touch <laughs> the That's true. <laughs> I'll give you the cleave. Again, I, I get what you're saying, Chad, but I, I think that the book... You know, in regards to some of the scenes that I remember, like one of my favorite scenes of all is, uh, again, I think they're holding up in a in one of the rooms and Sinspot turns turns his power on and holds the doorknob and says, there's no force on Earth that will open this door. I just thought that was such a great line and a great scene. And again, a great moment from Sunspot who really didn't get to do jack shit in the movie. I guess he had one little scene against the demon bear, but most of the time he was just washing dishes. And yeah, somebody had to do the dishes. Come on. Pop, pop in his collar. Uh, I like AC Sunspot. Leave him alone. All right. Well, anyways, we'll be right back with more of the last comic shop right after these messages. We're going to be eating our ratings for the demon bear saga. Validation in just a few minutes. My name is Nicholas Haskins, and I'd like a moment of your time to tell you about the 5th Annual Livestream for the Cure. To do that, I brought along two people whom I couldn't do this event without, Gerald Morris and Dan Brennick. Over the past four years, the Livestream for the Cure has raised over $30,000 for the Cancer Research Institute. That contribution is helping to fund research into cancer immunotherapy, training the body's immune system to fight all forms of cancer. This year, we're aiming for our biggest goal yet as we try to raise $15,000 in 50 hours on the air. Tune in May 19th through the 23rd as we're joined live by podcasters and content creators from around the world. With your help, we can continue the fight for a future immune to cancer. Together, we can make a difference. Back with more of the last comic shop, and uh, as you might have heard, we will be participating in the live stream for the Cure event. 
It is going to be a, a great uh, opportunity to raise some money for cancer research. And uh, we're hoping that uh, all of our listeners come out and support uh, this awesome little marathon, especially our hour of the yeah. uh, marathon. Represent Which, Last Comic Shop fans. Represent. Do some uh, good. That's right. We will be reviewing a comic book for all of our fans. It'll be uh, Superman versus the Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, Battle that, of the Century. <laughs> that great Bronze Age book. And that will all be happening on May 22nd from 11 a.m. to noon Eastern Standard Time. So if you're around a computer, uh, we'll have details out on our website and social media that you can uh, uh, tune in to the live stream to The Cure and uh, not only listen to uh, our hour, but stick around for all of those other fantastic podcasters from throughout the world to support cancer research. As they said, we can make a difference. And one way that we always like to make a difference on our show is through our ratings. Yes, we like to uh, assign a numerical value to all of the comic books that we rate on our particular program. And the Demon Bear Saga is no different. So Chris Claremont, Bill Sienkiewicz, yeah, you might be great talents, but you still get the last comic shop treatment. Which means we are going to assign a 1 out of 4 scale to you and your particular fictional work. And as always, J.A. Scott's going to give us a interesting way to rate our book this week. So, J.A., what is our rating scale for the Demon Bear Saga? All right. Well, our rating scale for the Demon Bear Saga, shout out to the Indigo Girls. It's going to be Kid Fears. <laughs> Kid Fears. I, I don't know why. I think you do this on purpose. You want to hear what the, the sound effect I come up with every single week is going to be. But there you go. Kid Fears. That was what it was. And uh, just to punish you for coming up with such a interesting rating scale, you get to go first. So, J.A., how many Kid Fears are you going to be rating the Demon Bear Saga comic book? Oh, this is all the fears. Four out of four Kid Fears. It's just... The perfect essence of Chris Claremont writing beautiful Bill Sienkiewicz art. It's got everything that that era of comics did well. A very well self-contained story. You don't need 12 issues. You don't need 24 crossover events. You just need three beautifully written and drawn comic books. You have little sprinklings of stuff here and there because it's obviously a series. So you it, you have some bookends with Warlock and uh, Rachel Summers. But the story itself, you see a team coming together, young kids starting to grow. Uh, it's got everything. Okay. Chad, how many kid fears are you giving this book? I, I can't help but agree. It's four tears for fears, but kid fears, whatever it is. This is great. This is the essence of 1980s comic bookery and that it captures all the stuff that's great about Chris Claremont. Like, the stuff that's wild and out there, Sienkiewicz is able to take that and put it in such a visual form that you feel the emotions. And this was back when they still made comic books for all ages, but especially for kids, especially for teenagers. And I couldn't think of anything that would speak to teenagers more than this story, you know, where... There's just so much going on and, and kids confronting their fears and sticking up for their friends and coming together and sometimes being jerks to each other and sometimes being in love with each other and sometimes that unrequited love. And there's all that other stuff going on. I just, I love it. It's the apotheosis of what it means to be a teenager distilled into comic book form. Zinkevich translates uh, Claremont's story perfectly. And like J.A. was uh, alluding to, yeah, there are other things that, you know, you can tell this is a comic book because they're setting up the B plot and the C plot, but... Uh, you could just take these three issues, and for all the tropes and any of the faults, I think this is exemplary of the time. I think this is the best of the best of the 80s. I mean, even from page one, you start there, and there's that blanket with the demon bear appearing in the red and white checkered blanket. Like, oh my god. This is, there's so many emotions and so much terror in, in these pages. It's beautiful, and I love it, and it's four stars. Well, I wholeheartedly agree that this is by far one of the best X-Men books. Oftentimes, I come back to this book to remind myself when I get so jaded of, through these massive crossovers with X-Men and like 
10,000 characters and, you know, 14 versions of Wolverine and time traveling mutants and all this other stuff. When it gets too convoluted, I come back to the Demon Bear saga because it reminds me of how thrilling X books can be when they're done right. I mean, again, you've got a team of nobodies, you know, and I think that's why this works well. Uh, you don't really need to know about these particular mutants other than they're mutants. Uh, and they come together in, in this book in a way that uh, it kind of sets the table for if you want to continue reading the new mutants from here, great, you can. You've got magic and she's the new freshness. You're going to get Warlock that's going to come in the next issue. So there's some great things to build on here. But at the end of the day, it's it's just a survival story. It's just a base under siege story. It's three issues about... You know, a, a team of five uh, kids, you know, getting together to come overcome somebody's greatest fear uh, in Daniel Moonstar and really defend her. I'm only going to give it, though, a 3.75 because, as I alluded to earlier, there is a part of this book that I really, really didn't like. And that is the Deo Ex Machina, whatever, timely intervention of the Morlock mutant, the healer. He's brought in by our special guest star store. It's a cop out. Mm. Sorry, folks. It's a cop out. Listen, like they bring... needed Danny for issue twenty one. That's and that's the thing. It's a cop out to bring things back to a status quo so that you can have to issue twenty one. It's corny. It's cheesy, and it totally deflates the Demon Bear as a villain after so many great issues of building it up. I mean, the battles of this magnitude should have consequences, like. Daniel Moonstar should be a paraplegic for a while. There are consequences to a battle of this epic proportion. For a while, in real life, when that stuff happens to people, they're paraplegics until they die. Mm. This is in real life. It's comic books. Well, Rick, well, she's, still got, she, it, she's still got bruises. She's got bandages oh. on. She's still psychically beat up. And it's not like she died and just came back because of some gold balls. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll give you that, but come on. At least to give me like five, ten issues where she has to work for that, like struggling to walk again, persevere through that, build her up as a character, make her become stronger as a result of that. Come on, this is just taking the easy way out. And that's why it's a 3.75 instead of a 4. They shouldn't have done it. They should have allowed Daniel Moonstar to have her own arc to kind of try to get better after this horrific battle. Forget uh, that. Two pages and then bring on Warlock. <laughs> We've got stuff to do. <laughs> All right. Well, some other things we've got to do on this show is give you our recommendations. Yes, uh, as we do often on this show, we like to tell you about other books that you can pick up at your local comic book store in addition to picking up maybe New Mutants on DVD or also picking up the Demon Bear Saga, uh, which you can get not only in single issues, which I think that you can definitely get it in trade. So um, regardless of whether you get it in any way that you can, uh, here are some other things that you can pick up. And as often we do it in terms of a current book, a similar book, any book out of left field. And we're going to go ahead and start off with our similar book. And that comes from J.A. Scott. So, J.A., what is our similar book for this week? So our similar book, also a Chris Claremont uh, written story. This takes all of two seconds in the Marvel continuity but covers seven years in limbo, and that is the four-issue Magic miniseries, which tells the story of Ilyana Rasputin, who I contend should probably be Ilyana Rasputina, but whatever, from a six-year-old child to a 13-year-old child where she is stuck in limbo and learning uh, all about sorcery and her powers and fighting uh, the demon Belasco and how she breaks free and, and comes back to Earth with the soul sword and her magic powers and her mutant ability also comes out. So uh, it was written, as I said, by Chris Claremont, illustrated by John Bushima, Ron Friends, Sal Bushima, and Tom Palmer. Uh, four issue run, sometimes called Ilyana and Storm, sometimes called Storm and Ilyana. Published in 83 and 84, so also in that beautiful VHS time frame. All right. A quick side note. Did you guys ever stop to think about, like, Ileana's brother 
is Peter Rasputin, Colossus, who turns himself into metal. Ileana is a sorceress supreme uh, who lives in limbo. She was a little girl, then she was a teenager, and like she, all this stuff has gone over there. Meanwhile, her brother is like, I can turn into metal. Boy, I, don't, I can't tell if she got the short end of the stick or the, the better end. The better end. I, one thing, as you said, she's a sorcerer supreme. It allows X-Men to cross over into Doctor Strangeland every so often. I've already recommended them on the show, I think. But those, those what-ifs, they, they like continue to what-if story where what if Ileana became the Sorcerer Supreme. It's awesome. It's by Leah Williams, and I can't think of the artist's name right now. Yeah, I, I, I got to agree. As much as people like Colossus, I was never a big fan. He's your strong man. That's your only job is to be the strong man on the X-Men. You're not even the strongest guy mm. out there. Like, you could have probably picked a better strong guy. I don't know. hurt his feelings. He's also very artistic. <laughs> he draws his paints and stuff. Best can do He's a so- gentle soul. Best thing he can do is support Kitty Pride, who's a true MVP of the X-Men. That's what he can do. He can make sure that she has her lunch packed. Anyways, uh, I'm going to be going next. And uh, this is our current book for uh, this week. And next week on the program, we're going to be reviewing a Star Wars book because it is going to be May the 4th be with you. And so I thought that I would go ahead and start talking about Star Wars now. And as a result, I wanted to really talk about... Uh, the new series that's been released by Marvel has been recently uh, collected in a trade called The Destiny's Path, and it's uh, by Charles Soule and uh, Jesus Says. It is a terrific Star Wars tale about what happens in the immediate aftermath of Empire Strikes Back. So for those folks that have maybe have been reading other Star Wars series since they were taken over by Marvel. Most of those happened in between New Hope and uh, Empire Strikes Back. This one's, you know, moving forward in the timeline, so Han Solo's not really involved here, but you get a Luke Skywalker that's completely disillusioned by the fact that he was lied to by all his mentors about the fact that Darth Vader had killed his father when, in fact, Darth Vader was his daddy. Again, you've got Leia, who's trying to continue to keep the Alliance together to their setbacks on Hoth. And after her personal setbacks of seeing Han Solo be frozen, uh, you've got Lando Calrissian, who's going from fantastically roguish scoundrel to an upstanding member of the uh, Rebel Alliance, like just like uh, Han Solo's arc. Except this one's, I think, a little more dramatic because really, in essence, Lando kind of didn't want anything to do with the Rebel Alliance at all unlike Han, who was just kind of looking for a home. And so it's a really great story, and uh, it kind of allows Charles Soule to kind of bring in a lot of the extra Star Wars stuff that's been happening in, I guess you would say, expanded media, or at least the some of the cartoons, like the main Inquisitor from Star Wars Rebels shows up for a little while to try to stop Luke from getting a new lightsaber. Also, there is talk about the High Republic, So those folks that are reading the High Republic stuff, uh, Luke goes looking for a gold lightsaber that's in one of the Jedi outposts from that era. So again, Charles, who's been writing some of that High Republic stuff, kind of gets to flex his muscles a little bit and bring it all together. But overall, it's just a really good story. Luke gets some great character moments. Darth Vader gets to be menacing. And again, I think the star of the show is Lando. Just seeing him evolve uh, throughout this particular trade really does give the character a lot more backstory. And it makes you feel a little more complete when you finally see him join the Rebel Alliance and return to the Jedi. So make sure that you go pick it up. Star Wars, The Destiny Path. And now it is time for Chad to give us his out of left field book. There you go. So my out of left field pick... Let me set the scene here. It's uh, the early 90s, and a little 10-year-old Chad is getting into comics. You know, the Batman movie had come out the last year, and that really lit the spark. And so, fortunately, I I have very loving parents that wanted to support me in reading, because I was finally excited about reading stuff. So one day they take me to the, the comic shop, and, you know, my dad hands me some money. He says, here, go pick out whatever you want. And uh, what did I pick up? Because I recognized the name Frank Miller from all these Batman stories that I had read. I picked up Frank Miller and Bill Sinkevitt, Electra Assassin, the trade paperback. 
Now, this is not something a 10-year-old should have picked up at that time. This was a book. It was launched through the Epic imprint because it was adult in nature. It, it took on ultraviolence, and you have Elektra, and she's going up against a shield, and there's this beast character, and it was it was Bill Sienkiewicz by way of Ralph Steadman, if you know who Ralph Steadman is. It was like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas in comic book form. And I remember being as a kid, not understanding it, but thinking, wow, this is interesting. I don't know what it is, but I think I love it. And like, and Sienkiewicz goes full watercolor on there. And his art, as you know, is beautiful and weird and strange and scary and all of those things. Whenever you have Electra involved, it's, you know, there's this element of beauty and this element of ultraviolence. There's so many things that are wrapped up in there. And even to this day, like I can still go back and look through those pages and it's, it's, it's a great story. If you're into the gonzo going back to uh, Hunter Thompson's style, you'll get a kick out of this. But I, I remember fondly as, you know, being a 10 year old, flipping through those pages and be like, wow, I should have been able to get this. <laughs> dad, remember it takes to get you excited about reading. My dad did that, the trick. That is true. That is true. At the last comic shop, we don't judge. If that's what it takes to get you in, into the comic book tent, so be it. I, I remember back in the day that I, I had never read Demon Bear Saga. Actually, the first uh, New Mutants that I read was uh, the story that happens, I think, shortly before that, where basically Magma joins the team. And so they're fighting Selene, the immortal mutant in like some sort of underground area. Long story short, it's just a lot of Magma and Daniel Moonstar running around in bikinis most of the time. <laughs> Uh, and, and and that got me interested in some <laughs> comics for sure. There you go. <laughs> Anyways, you never know what's going to catch. Uh, make sure that you check us out every week at www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com. We don't need bikinis there to, because we've got all these fantastic episodes. Again, our reviews are done so that they're evergreen. You can go back and you can listen to old reviews we've done on the on this podcast. We do that on purpose so that if you pick up a book, you've read it, and then you go out to our website and you say, wow, I just read Wonder Woman Dead Earth, and now I want to see what the guys think. And uh, you can do that by uh, rate reviewing and subscribing to any of the myriad of places like Apple Podcasts and Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, YouTube, CastBox, and a variety of other podcasting platforms. In addition, while you're listening to some of these podcasts, we hope you go out there and buy some what, J.A.? Well, you get some merchandise. We've got t-shirts. We've got hoodies. We've got coffee mugs. And this week only, get your scrunchies and cut-off tees straight from the 80s. <laughs> oh, some uh, fitness leggings, some leg warmers, some high yep. tops. High th- some jelly bracelets. Some slap bracelets. That's what we need, man. Man, you could cut into some flesh with some, <laughs> with some slap bracelets. Just call off and whack someone. I, I remember they... Uh, they banned those from my middle school at one point. Oh, they banned them from every school. <laughs> and I was going to say, while we might be the last comic shop, there's a good chance there's still plenty of comic shops near you where you can take your impressionable young children and hand them a couple of bucks and say, pick out whatever you want and see what sort of inappropriate things they can find and learn to love to read by staring at the pictures and figuring out what the heck is this. But uh, you can find that at uh, comicshoplocator.com. Uh, where they can direct you to a great place to uh, find some cool stuff. All right. And until next time, I was the host of most Andy Larson, and I was joined by Chad Smith and J.A. Scott. And as always, stay safe, stay sheltered, and make sure that you keep your hand puppets close, because you never know when they might come in handy. (laughs) How cool was that? First live-action appearance of Lockheed. The whole time, he's just... That's the little hand puppet, and you think, oh, that's a nice little homage to Lockheed. And then he comes to life! That is friggin' awesome! What I want to know, is Maisie Williams going to be dragging a Jason in everything she does? The last comic shop was a 2021... Black Angus Production.